Heaven is a wonderful place. It's a good song. Hadn't sung that one before. Uh, good to be with you, be able to worship with you and share from God's Word this morning. I'd like to pray before I speak. Heaven, Lord, we are delighted to talk about heaven today, and we ask that your words would be heard and that you would bless us. We thank you, Lord, for every chance we have to listen to your Holy Spirit and to hear your message. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week after talking about loss and lessons and sharing personal story from our family, I thought let's, let's kind of develop uh, the end of that message a little bit more and talk about heaven. Now, when you look at the picture here, if you're unfamiliar with its cultural context, you might be tempted to think that's a picture of heaven. I mean, you've got streets of gold, you've got uh, the new city of God, the rainbow, the, the earth made new with flowers, right? It looks a little bit like heaven. The rainbow looks like heaven, doesn't it? Does anyone here think it looks by he like heaven? I mean, I'm, I'd like to know that you're out there. But it's not heaven. It is actually a yellow bricked road going to an emerald city through a field of poppies. And uh, actually, if you're biblically accurate, what color will the rainbow over God's throne in heaven be? Revelation chapter 4, anyone? Green. Actually, it's not green. Emerald. <laughs> it's going to be an emerald rainbow, not an emerald city. So Frank Baum got it a little bit incorrect in his, uh, in his book. Um, we will... Uh, explain that picture a little bit more. That's from the Wizard of Oz. Ah, we have one young man who knows what I'm talking about. I want to talk about, hey, you just changed it back there. Is it still? Okay. Let's see. I want to, before I get into my kids quiz, I want us to look at a passage from Steps to Christ. It's the fifth chapter of the book. Some of your Bibles Oh, excuse me, some of your Bibles. Whew. Some of you who have copies of Steps to Christ, the chapter will be called Consecration. Sometimes the chapter will be called Complete Commitment. Complete Commitment, which is consecration, something that is completely committed to a sacred task. Complete Commitment. Notice what she says, the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The warfare against yourself, the wrestling that we do on our own conscience and our own desires, the yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle. And I love the imagery of Jacob wrestling with God, who he clings to him at the end and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's a beautiful idea of the wrestling that we have with ourselves and with our own situations. It requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. Before we can be renewed in holiness, and a, a, a commitment and a submission to God must come first. She goes on to say at the very end of the chapter, last paragraph of complete commitment or consecration, by yielding up your will to Christ, the battle against self, right? By yielding up your will to Christ. You ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. That's good news, isn't it? Why would we hesitate to do this? If by yielding up our will, we become partakers and recipients of the greatest power in all the universe, and yet we resist. That's why it's the greatest battle. You ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above. 
to hold you steadfast, and thus through constant surrender to God, this is important, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. Do you want to live the new life? Do you want to wait until heaven, or would you like to live the new life now? And Ellen White so beautifully and balancedly uh, uh, explores and examines the reality that it is both our constant surrender to God, and yet we have to actively choose to live within that. So we can argue about perfectionism and, and behavioralism all day long, and the answer is both. We are expected to live holy lives. The Bible's clear on that. Live, be holy, the Lord says. So yes, there is no excuse for sin. There is no excuse for us to live a life enslaved to the powers of darkness, and yet we cannot experience that life unless we surrender to Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, any of you grow up singing the hymns like, I surrender all, I surrender all. You sung that one before, right? Did you surrender all when you sang that song? The battle against self, the greatest battle. I want to talk about the new life. I want to talk about how the promise of exactly what Andre actually shared in the children's story, appreciate that, uh, applies to our lives today when we remember that there is uh, a place that God calls our home. I want to talk with the young people today if I can get um, some helpers uh, Toby, you are so faithful. We're going to go with Black here, Brenda. Maybe uh, Toby can handle it on his own. Uh, now, if only someone would help me, if only someone would help me answer this quiz, if there was one person out there who would be willing, um, question, where was Jesus born? Bethany, Bethlehem, Jericho, or Nazareth? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. We, we raise our hands in this classroom. I, I'm sorry. But I would love to have your participation. But Dylan's going to explode if I don't call on him. So Dylan, where was Jesus born? B. <laughs> well, say the name. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. That is right. So Jesus is born in Bethlehem, but was that his home? No. It wasn't his home. Question number two. Well, okay, so where did Jesus grow up? He didn't grow up in Bethlehem. Was it Jericho, Capernaum, or Capernaum, Jerusalem? Nazareth. Where did Jesus grow up? I see Eric's hand, which Eric, by the way, oh, I heard you, and you got it right. Uh, Someone told me it's your birthday today. Happy birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to Eric. Happy birthday to Eric. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Eric. Stand up, Eric. Happy birthday to you. Everybody look at Eric. God bless you, Eric. (laughs) Special treatment. We don't sing happy birthday just to everyone here. (sighs) By the way, my birthday's coming up in August, just in case you're nervous. I heard him say Nazareth. So Nazareth is where he grew up. So that was his home? Well, maybe. All right, next question. When Jesus was 12, he called something his father's house. He uses that phrase. He says, this is my father's house. What was he referring to? Was he talking about his home in Nazareth where he grew up? Was it talking about the, maybe the synagogue in Bethlehem, the temple, the palace? What was he talking about? Isaiah. The king's palace. That's a great answer, but he wasn't actually specifically talking about that. Okay, Dylan's had a shot. Um, Let's give Caleb a chance. I see you guys. I see you guys, Sean and and Owen. But I'd like to see if uh, Caleb can help. The temple. He was. Caleb got it right. He said he's talking about the temple. Remember the story when he's 12 and he's teaching in the temple and his mom and dad lose sight of him. So if the temple's his father's house, then that was his home, right? Obviously, where your father is, that's where you're, well, maybe in a way. Mitch, you're shaking your head. I don't know. Is this confusing? So if none of these really are his ultimate home, where was Jesus's true home? 
No, no options. I just want to, that's just an open question. Okay, we do have a young man uh, up here. I don't know your name. What's your name? Logan? Logan. Hey, thanks for being here, Logan. What, where's Jesus' home? Heaven. He's been listening. Notice that? <laughs> He's been listening. I like that. You are right. Heaven, and specifically in the presence of the Father, is where Jesus would call his home. He says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. So no place in the world would be the presence of the Father uh, specifically. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. So his ultimate, he came from heaven to the earth, so that was his home. I think that was the last one on the, the quiz. Thank you, Toby. And thank you to all of our young people for starting us off by looking at this question. What is a home? People define it maybe differently. There may be different concepts of, of really discerning what a home is. Uh, these are just some kind of general uh, ideas that you might hear. A home is the place that you live. That's where you live. That's your home. You live there. You sleep there. You eat there. That's where home is. Other people will say, well, it's more about a feeling. It's where you feel safe. That's home, where you feel secure, where you feel a sense of peace or serenity. That's home. That sounds like the beach to me. <laughs> I love the beach. The place where you keep your stuff, that's home. Where, where's all your stuff? Is it somewhere else? No, you keep your stuff at home because it's safe, it's secure, it's where you live. Others, again, these are all kind of synonymous, I get it. Home is the place where you feel comfortable, you feel happy, you know, where you're at. That, you know, if you feel comfortable and happy, then that can be said to be home. A, 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 a more, you know, just simplistic way, home is where you understand you belong. I belong here. Here is where home is because I feel a sense of, of belonging. Therefore, it is my home. Now, you can visit other places. You can travel. You can, you know, be a guest. You can experience new things, but you, you really, you usually want to return to the place you belong, no matter how much you love travel. You know when you get home and you lie in your own bed, right? You've been traveling for a week, two weeks. You've been camping you know, even nice hotels that have the cushy beds and all that, when you get home to your own sheets, your own bed, you know, then you're home because that's where you belong. So where do we belong? Now, that sounds like an easy question. It sounds like an easy question, but I, I would challenge you to think about it more than just what the obvious might suggest. And when I say we, I'd like to say we as believers, right? We as the church. We as individuals who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. Where do we belong? Do we belong here? In a way, in an element, we are of the earth and, and, and all of that. But because of our uh, uh, transformation that has taken place in Jesus Christ, we belong to heaven, right? Right? This isn't meant to be higher level stuff. We belong to heaven, but by what merits do we belong in heaven? By our own merits? Because we've earned it? Because we deserve it? How can God keep us from it? We can demand it? No, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, the promise of heavenly belonging is ours. The promise of heavenly belonging belonging. Because if we have been transformed by Jesus Christ, this world will not be a comfortable place. And that's the challenge. That's part of the challenge. If we've grown too comfortable here, if we've decided that we belong here, then we're missing uh, a great reality of what God wants us to look forward to in heaven. There's no place like home. You've ever heard that before? There's no place like home click your heels together three times, right? There's no place like home. Now, if you are familiar with American culture at all, you cannot escape at least some of the connection with the movie The Wizard of Oz. It is the most viewed movie in the world. Did you know that? 
all those who evaluate culture, all those who evaluate cinema and theater, and all these things agree, this is the most viewed movie of all time. Did you know that? Came out in the 1930s. Um, if you're not familiar with it, if you're part of the percentage that, you know, maybe you don't have it, it's a very simple story. Uh, a little girl, Dorothy, doesn't like her simple farm life, so she dreams of a more colorful, more adventurous, more free, liberating world that she could live. And then during a tornado, she bumps her head. She wakes up and finds that her house has been transported over the rainbow to the magical world of Oz. And in Oz, she makes new friends, but there's an enemy that's against her, and she has to go on adventures, and she sings songs and dances, and she defeats the enemy. She unmasks asks the wizard, and then at the end of the story, she finds out all the things that she longed for in Oz were not comparable to home. And so she has to uh, uh, go through the, the magic of getting home by repeating, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And then she wakes up back on her farm at home, and she comes to realize that everything she looked forward in this other magical land actually was with her all along. Her friends were there. Her home was there. Her happiness had always been at home. Now you know the entire story of the Wizard of Oz. Fast forward in very cliff note version. Not only is the Wizard of Oz the most viewed movie of all time, it's also one of the most quotable movies. People know more quotes, whether you remember them as attached to the movie or not, they are so ingrained into our culture that they are uh, uh, hard to escape. Um, just a few of them, somewhere over the rainbow. If I only had a brain, that comes from the Wizard of Oz. I'm not saying that myself. I'm just, it's from the movie, right? <laughs> We're not in Kansas anymore. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. Follow the yellow brick road. Lions and tigers and bears. Ah, oh my. So you've seen it. Yeah, I know. A horse of a different color. And I, I, we could list some more. Did you notice we had several munchkins up here doing worship today? Now, if you've never seen the movie, you know what I'm referring to when I say munchkin. Little people, pa parents that don't even know the movie, they'll say, hey, oh, my little munchkins are here, right? Referring to their children as small individuals. That comes from the Wizard of Oz. The man hiding behind the curtain. That kind of idea. You hear that phrase used. Who's the one pulling the strings? Who's the man behind the curtain? That comes from Frank Baum. That comes from the Wizard of Oz. But probably the most significant phrase is that one that comes at the end of the movie. There's no place like home. Now, I didn't coin the phrase, obviously, that had been used before, but it creates a dynamic of appreciation of the concept. There is no place like home. There's no place like home. Well, where's our home? And is there really no place like home? I want to take you through a story of Jesus, and we're going to look at several passages uh, of the Bible uh, throughout the, the message today. But Jesus at one time goes home. And I want you to, to see what happens in that and draw some implications from it. This is from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 6. Fairly later in the ministry of Jesus, Mark goes very fast. So um, by the time you get to Mark chapter 6, it might not be late uh, in the book of Mark, but in the ministry of Jesus, he's well established as the Messiah and as a rabbi. It says that Jesus went out from there and came into his own hometown or his own country. Not country like the country of Israel, like, but if you grew up in the country, right? The region, the territory. Jesus came to the place that he had grown up and his disciples followed him. Now, remember the context. Jesus leaves Nazareth, Nazareth, excuse me, as a man. He leaves Nazareth as a carpenter. He leaves Nazareth as a local boy. He had not proclaimed his Messiahship. He had not received the ordination of the Holy Spirit. He had not been baptized. When he leaves Nazareth as a young man, we don't know all the details leading up to his baptism, he was just a local boy. But he does not return as a local boy. He comes to his hometown. His disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. He does what he'd always done. Now, this is the synagogue that he'd grown up in. 
This was his home synagogue. He knew it well. The people there clearly knew him well, as the story reveals. And he comes in, but he's now returned to his hometown, not just as a local boy, not just as the carpenter's son. He's now come as the Messiah. He's now come as the Son of God. He has now come as the rabbi, the teacher of Israel. And so he enters into the synagogue, this time not as a recipient, not as a listener. He comes in with authority. He comes in with wisdom. He comes in with power, and he begins to teach. And he says, the listeners were amazed. They were astonished. If you had been there, you would have been astonished too. Every time Jesus opens his mouth, there's something valuable. There's something powerful to be gained from that. And the Bible says that they reflected saying, where did this man get these things? Notice they call him this man. They're distancing himself. They don't call him by name in this part, or they don't identify him. They just say, this guy, where did this man get these things? We know he didn't get them from here. That's not who he was when he left. Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as has been performed by his hands. So they acknowledge his wisdom. They acknowledge that he is a man of power. He has done miracles. And then they comment, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the, the brother of James and Joseph, Judas, Simon? Are not his sisters with us? They're saying, we thought we knew who he was. We thought we knew he, him as the local boy, but something has changed. Now notice the very next thing, though. And they took offense at Jesus. Despite his wisdom, despite his power, despite their acknowledgement that he had the ability to do miracles, because he did not meet their other expectations, they get angry. They're offended. They don't want him there. They want him to leave. They reject him in his own hometown, in the very synagogue, in the very church that he grew up in. They're offended at Jesus. And Jesus quotes what is largely considered a proverb. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor and except in his own hometown, among his own relatives, in his own household. And he could do no miracle. I love how Mark says this. He could do no miracle except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, as though that's a minor thing. They would gotten so used to Jesus being abundant, being lavish in his work of miracle, that Mark's like, well, he healed a few people, but that was really quite minor. How, wouldn't you, how many of you wouldn't mind if Jesus healed a few people here today? Would you be like, well, that was a minor thing? Or you'd be like, praise God. But Jesus, because of their lack of faith, because of their offense, because of their rejection, because of, of their expectation of Jesus to be something they had created in their minds, rather than what God had determined Him to be, it prevented Jesus from pouring out the blessings of God in abundance. Only a few people could be healed. And the Bible says He wondered at their unbelief. He was amazed and probably greatly shocked. You can imagine of all places that Jesus wanted to pour out the blessings of God, it would have been home where He knew the neighbors by name, where He knew the elders in the synagogue, where He knew the marketplaces. But of all places that Jesus could not be accepted and do the work of God with greater abundance and power, it was in His home hometown. They took offense at him. You ever read this story before? Ever wondered about this at all? Why would people, understanding the wisdom, acknowledging the power and the miracles, still look at that and say, no, that bothers me? Why did they take offense at Jesus in their church and in their community. 
I think it's more than just that he'd grown up as a boy, they'd seen him, and it's just hard for them to fathom that the, the young man that had grown up with Joseph, with, with Mary, and all the brothers, that, that he could become something so far beyond. They expected the Messiah to just kind of drop from the sky. They, ex- they expected the Messiah to come marching in on a white steed as a great warrior and champion. They couldn't fathom that God would do the work through someone known to them that could be designated as the anointed Messiah of God. They took offense. Have you noticed that people get offended very easily today? That we live in a culture where people really wake up looking to be offended. They wear it as a badge of honor. They have little community groups uh, everywhere in colleges and communities where people get together to talk about how they've been offended today. They keep lists, they blog, they write about how they were offended. Uh, They went to a grocery store, they were on the road, something happened, someone commented, and oh, how terribly offended they were. It's not just a, a passing phenomenon. It's something that has been growing and maturing and manifesting people. Now, to some degree, probably most of you have experienced kind of this level of toxic uh, 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 uh you know, relations to, you know, whether it's with a, a friend, a family member, um, where you, you've heard the phrase before, you had to walk on eggshells, you know, because if you step on uh, something that makes a crack, then they're upset. Uh, I, I have shared before, I don't know if I've shared uh, from, from this uh, place, but in other uh, settings, I have been in a church that was quite uh, uh, like this where there was so much distrust, there was so much animosity that literally, literally, if you told someone in the church, happy Sabbath, you'd be getting a call that afternoon saying, why did you say that? What did you mean by that? Why were you saying that? Are you trying to say I shouldn't have a happy Sabbath? Are you trying to say I should have a happy Sabbath whether you like it or not? How dare you suggest that I should have a happy Sabbath? I'm not embellishing. You couldn't do it. There was such a heavy blanket of, 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 of just sadness. You, you walked to church, you kept your eyes on the floor because you might, oh, if I look at sister, so, if so-and-so, brother over, if elder so-and-so, it was, it was heavy. It was tragic. But we've kind of become somewhat of a society like that today in America people looking, people automatically assuming negativity. No matter what you intended, that's irrelevant. I heard what I wanted to hear, and I don't like it. I take offense. It doesn't matter how much wisdom or miracle power is being presented. In his own hometown, among his own relatives and neighbors, his faith, power, and wisdom was rejected. It was offensive. Jesus experienced exactly what we are experiencing today in our own hometown. Why? Because of their lack of faith. Because of their unwillingness to submit to the plan of God. Because they had created a God in their own image that they were unwilling to adjust when the reality of God's plan was sitting there in their church. And that is exactly what is happening in our world with greater velocity and greater enthusiasm than ever. We are a culture that lacks faith. And it should not surprise us That when you walk into the classroom, when you walk into the workplace, when you're out in the community, if you say anything that smacks of the true faith of the Bible, people will be offended. Now, I'll tell you personally, I hate it when people don't like me. You know, there are people that don't mind that. I mean, they don't care what you think of them. And they just go along their merry way. I I am not that person. If someone doesn't like me, it bothers me. I'm sorry about that time, Mitch, that, you know, we had that issue. No, I'm just kidding. I don't like it when I know someone 
especially someone I know. And if I failed them in somehow, or maybe I said, it drives me crazy. I want to resolve it. The challenge that we face in this world with all the good intentions, with all the wisdom of God, with all the miraculous power of God, we have to get used to the fact our faith will offend people. Our goal is not to offend. Our goal is to stand for revealed truth and righteousness as it's found in Jesus Christ. But the devil will not allow that to go unaddressed because of their unbelief in him. Do you ever feel like your faith is offensive to others? You don't mean it. But if you stand today and say, I'm sorry, I believe in a God of love. I believe that He died on the cross for my sins. I believe that He has a home in heaven. I believe that He created the world in six days. I believe that He created marriage to be sanctified. I believe that He made the Sabbath to be sanctified. If you stand, if you stay, you know, state your faith, your convictions, you are, can be, and growing rapidly will be considered offensive. You want to know why? Because this is not our home. This is not our home. This is a, a place that God loves, wants to see redeemed, but ultimately He is developing a perfect home in heaven. And our role and our mission is to help individuals accept and realize that they can be part of that home as well. But in that journey, in that mission, in that ministry, we have to get ready for the idea that if we stand for God, not arrogantly, not, not manipulatingly, but just to state our case, the devil will do everything he can to disrupt and make it a problem. Jesus, in his words to his disciples, he's praying to the Father, and he says to the, he says to the Father, I have given them his followers, the disciples, you and me, I have given them your word, the word of life, the word of power, the word of freedom and forgiveness. I've given them your word, the word of truth. And the world has what? Hated them, not tolerated them. The world has hated them because they are not of the world. Believers, you and I, those who've accepted Jesus Christ, we are not of the world. And the more we try to make ourselves like the world because of fear, because of wanting to just uh, compromise, we distance ourselves from the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus says they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. There's no place like home. Amen. Believer in the house today. Woo. Couple of just quick passages, and um, I know you've heard it before. If you've been in the church at any length of time, you've you've heard uh, uh, sermons along these lines. Ecclesiastes chapter three. I love what the old preacher Solomon says in this passage. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse eleven. He says, "God." has made everything appropriate in its time, and He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work of God which He has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them to do than to rejoice and to do good for one's lifetime. I, I wanted to throw what the commentary said about this uh, that I liked. It is God's design that man re realize that the present material world does not constitute the sum of his existence. He's linked to two worlds, physically to this world, but mentally, emotionally, psychologically to the eternal world. Even with his consciousness beclouded by sin, man seems dimly aware that he ought to, con he ought to continue living beyond the narrow confines of this unsatisfying life. It is God's design that we realize that we are not at home in this world. We are pilgrims. We are travelers. We are passing through. Ephesians chapter 2, we're studying Ephesians in our, our quarterly lesson. 
And so I have a couple of verses from Ephesians. I didn't put these on the screen. You know, it's a good thing to bring your Bible to church every now and then and uh, to read it for yourself. If you're uh, not used to bringing your Bible, sometimes I put all the verses on the screen and that's fine. But this time I'm just quoting them from uh, the Bible and asking if you want to turn in your Bibles there. Ephesians chapter 2, consider what Paul says here. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved, and has raised us up with Him, and now listen to this, and has seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That means by faith, when you accept Jesus Christ, your residency, your placement, your home is with Jesus Christ in heaven, and not just anywhere in heaven, on the throne next to Him. We have been seated with Jesus in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He goes on in verse 19. So you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints of God's household. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. A couple more, and I promise I'll get you to potluck. Colossians chapter 3, same idea, but I like how he says it here in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, have you been raised up with Christ? I, I, I can't, oh, I don't, see, I don't know if I hear a lot of conviction. Have you been raised up with Jesus Christ? Have you given your heart to Jesus? Have you experienced transforming grace? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to come into your life? By the way, if anyone is struggling with that question, come talk to me. I'd love to encourage you. I'd love to share with you the mercies of Jesus Christ that will bring you to a place where you can uh, just with joy and energy say yes to that question. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. What are we supposed to be seeking? The things above. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Now, this isn't about neglecting planet earth. This isn't about neglecting our fellow man. We are called to be ministers. We're called to be ambassadors. We're called to be conduits of God's grace to our fellow man. But our focus is on God's things in heaven. Set your mind on the things above, not the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The things of this earth we are dead to. They should have no power in our life. The deeds of the world, the selfishness, the bent of sin that drives the major issues of this world, they should have no attraction to us because we're dead to them. As we accept Jesus Christ and allow Him to guide us in that, we're not, no, none of us have fully arrived and are perfect and aren't bothered or impacted by the things around us. The last one then, one of the best. Going back into the Gospels, John 14, again, I know you are familiar with what Jesus Himself says. Quoted from John 17 earlier, here's John 14, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, now which house is He talking about? Is He talking about the temple in Jerusalem? No, He's talking about a different house. He's talking about the house that's in heaven. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, many mansions in the King James, right? Many places. And I go there to prepare a place for who? For us, for the believers in Jesus Christ, for His disciples. I go there to to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I might come again. Oh, did I get that wrong? I'm sorry. There's a chance that I could come again. I'm glad seven of you are listening today. Praise God. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also because you belong in heaven with God because of the merits of Jesus Christ, because of the sacrifice of Christ, because of the promise of God, because of His adoption despite our fallenness, because of His forgiveness and His blood and mercy, we belong with Jesus and with the Father in heaven. That is our home. And friends, there is no place like home. There is no place like home. This place, no matter how much we try to twist and contort to fit our, our, ourselves into the brokenness of this world, it will never work. Our calling is to reach individuals with the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to convert culture. Ooh, I might get some letters on that one, Chuck. Is it our job to convert culture? We're not home yet. Heaven is our home. Would you pray this with me? Lord, help us not to get too comfortable here. The greater we create, you know, a desire to fit in this world, we are distancing ourselves from the true home that God has for us. We are called to live like God not live like the world. Help us not to get too comfortable here. Lord, help us when times get tough here. Jesus said, I've given them my world, my word, and the world will hate them. Help us, Lord, when times get tough. And remind us of our mission, which is to help others find their home as well. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Heaven is our home. That's not a picture of Oz. That's still the wrong colored rainbow, sorry. That's an artist depiction of what heaven and the city of God might look like. Do you know where your home is today? Are you confident that Jesus has a place for you in heaven? Are you ready to surrender all in the battle against self so that you can be empowered to live the new life now? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, It sounds, at least I tried to make it sound easy, Lord, and yet we all understand in its core, this is the major issue for every believer, is to accept your word, accept your power and your grace, and lay our brokenness aside. It can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit and through us opening our hearts to you, Lord. But as we march faster and faster into the last days. Help us to remember that this world is not lasting forever. As sad and tragic as it is, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many find it, but it's the minority that find the narrow way. Lord, we want to be confident We want to have complete commitment to be consecrated. We don't go out purposely to offend or hurt anyone, but we know that faith itself will be challenged. God, bless your people. Bless your church. And Lord, help us to be confident that you are with us every step of the way. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.